Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Yang, Creative Director of Behalf Studio, and I will be the moderator of today. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for gathering with us here on a weekend afternoon. Um, I, I know you might have other things to do. Uh, our virtual events, Creativity Without Compromise, is presented by ICM Falk Foundation in collaboration with Behalf Studio. Um, this is an event of Vietnam Festival of Creativity and Design 2021 an event uh, initiated by RMIT University in collaboration with U United Nations uh, Educational, Scientific and Culture Organizations, uh, UNESCO, Vietnam National Institute of Culture and Art Studies, VCAS, and Collab Vietnam with Hanoi Grapevine as the media partner. So um, this event will be recorded and will be featured later on VFCD YouTube channel with Vietnamese subtitles. Um, and. Uh, let me start by introducing a little bit about the event. Um, functioning in Vietnam and understand its challenges to be sustainable, particularly in uh, creativity industry, um, as ourselves as a design studio, we, um, we find it uh, an, an interesting topic of uh, ever-growing interest. So we collaborate this talk with uh, ICM Falk Foundation, aiming to be a platform where circular design concepts will be explained and discussed from theory to practice. Uh, our event is joined today by sustainability enthusiasts and creative industry practitioners. So uh, before we start, I would like to mention quickly the best practices during the event. So um, best practice for the event. Number one, please make sure your mic is on mute. Number two is uh, you're invited to use the chat box to discuss and ask questions throughout the event. And number three, you are encouraged to interact and engage with our speakers and panelists using the chat box. Our team members will collect questions and we will respond to you during the Q&A sessions. Briefly about the agenda of uh, what will be covered today. Our event format will start with an informative session about circular design and upstream innovation presented by ICM Falk Foundation and will be following by a panel discussion sessions with our three panelists on their implementations and sustainability uh, within the practice. And finally, a live Q&A session in which the audience can engage directly with our panelists. Um, without further ado, uh, I would like to start the first part of our event. I would like to introduce Ms. Tiffany Pham from uh, ICM Falk Foundation to uh, introduce about the organizations and walk us through the first part. Thank you, Zan, for the introduction. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. So the ICM Falk Foundation is a US-based nonprofit family foundation. Uh, we fund, facilitate, and foster circular innovation for a sustainable future. And um, more practically, we do, uh, we do support work for research researchers, capacity building uh, organizations or universities. And most importantly, we support entrepreneurial efforts in finding upstream solutions to the waste and the plastic waste problem uh, more specifically. So for this first part, um, we um, designed and we, we curated the content for this um, knowledge section to be an introduction to circular design and upstream innovation as uh, a whole from the lens of a designer. And of course, there will be more information available um, for the audience um, in the takeaway document after the, after the event. So let's begin. Um, so for design, there's a big sustainability problem, as we all know. And the waste problem here is a day-to-day -day, um, thing. As you can see in the following pictures, we see that fruits are being wrapped very mindlessly and more plastic uh, packaging and the packaging that we're receiving from e-commerce is very um, wasteful. So the question is, where did all this start? And um, a simple solution and, or a simple answer would be, um, is this simply not good design? Because good design would really consider how can we uh, reduce and eliminate waste? How can we keep um, products and materials um, in the life cycle in the use cycle as long as we can? And eventually, how can we return uh, materials back to nature um, in a sustainable way? So if we zoom out a little bit, it's more than just a packaging problem. It's more than just you know, your fruit 
um, packaging at the supermarket, it's actually a global problem. Right now, all the materials that we've been using for human consumption or production uh, and manufacturing are going to landfills, incineration plants, or even leaking into natural environments. And a striking number here is the 29 million tons of plastic that could be leaked into the oceans if we don't do anything uh, differently the next two um, decades. And of course, some might say that we need to recycle better, we need to sort our waste better, but um, in fine, it's not a sustainable solution because it's not sufficient. And we need to design things better in order to complement the recycling effort. And that's what we're calling the upstream um, perspective of um, innovation to really reduce and prevent waste from ever entering the production and um, consumption stream. So as a, um, yeah, so as a summary of all the, the, pro the sustainability problems that designers could encounter um, is the problem of using materials. So first of all, when, we're, when designers think of um, products and services that they're um, making and um, conceptualizing, they're not thinking enough of the limited re resources that we're having on the planet um, that's leading to very wasteful design in products that end up being just waste or not properly used and disposed of. And as a whole, that is a problem of mindset, as in we're not really thinking of a proper problem solution fit in the way we're conceptualizing or designing products and services. And that's a mindset that we need to change. And this quote really um, encapsulates what a designer needs to do um, in order to do good um, design and uh, the simple solution and the simple answer is like to design according to um, circular principles that makes design that makes your product and services professional and responsible towards nature and towards um, um, the communities. Um, so as a designer, what do you need to do? Like what is your role in this bigger problem that we're citing right now? Um, so as a 21st century designer, your role is more than just um, finding solutions to very simple problems as in creating a brand or creating a logo. It's about finding a way to um, put your products or services as an interaction within a bigger scope of things, as in like you need to think about the experiences that people would use your product and services in. And then eventually we would end up with um, a more holistic and interconnected way of solution um, finding with systems and um, and that's what we call a holistic and um, systems thinking of um, a designer. So a framework that a designer could think of and what we're suggesting here is that um, a designer could use the circular principles that um, that is there actually a practice that embraces system thinking where we need where we can solve interconnected problems um, as early as the design stage um, for a product. And this, these principles are, um, comes in, come in three points. The first one is how can you eliminate waste and pollution from the very beginning? And then how could you circulate your products and materials once it's been generated? And at the end, how can you re regenerate all the natural resources that you've been using for your products and services? And in details, the, um, the first part of waste and pollution elimination is all about how can you design products from the beginning that is well thought, well used, and that would not become eventual um, unnecessary waste in the world. Once the product is made, that's when we talk about um, circulating the product and the material. How can you keep it as long as you can um, for the consumer, um, either by repairing, recycling it, or refilling it? So that's another way of rethinking business models. And once we're done with um, product circulation, we also need to think about um, how can we return what we use from the earth back to, back to nature? And um, the most important part here is to think that on a human scale, we need to return it and not just like in a, a century or so. And what we need to dig a little deeper here is also the um, concept of upstream innovation, where design is really primordial because good design would in would um, result in effective solutions to solve interconnected planetary challenges. And here, um, the bigger solution or like the bigger picture that designers could use and think of is the rethink aspect of your uh, materials use. And there would be three strategies that designers um, could use. The first strategy would be eliminating what you don't need from the design stage. So for example, the fruit packaging, we actually need um, cellophane packaging around a banana or an orange. 
Um, the second strategy would be to um, think about how can you reuse products or how can you design products that could be reused easily. Um, simple um, example would be um, a water bottle that would be designed to ease um, refilling activities, so cleaning, refilling, and then transporting it to. And lastly, the third strategy for upstream innovation would be how can you circulate the materials more easily? Um, for example, it could be a plastic bottle with an easy peel labeling um, glue that could help you peel it off easily and then send it to recycling facilities in a more efficient manner. And of course, when we talk about um, upstream strategies, we also need to think about all the factors that a designer slash business owner could also think of when could also think of when they uh, come up with new products. The first factor would be the materials. Are your materials resp responsibly sourced? Is it um, regenerated easily once it's used? Secondly, that would be ethics. Are you using labor in a mindful and a thoughtful manner responsibly too? And finally, is your product going to be financially sound? As in, would it create a good cash flow? And is it affordable to the end consumer? With all these in mind, we want to show a few examples of what's been done both in Vietnam and abroad. So the first two examples here um, are creative ways that students from Bat Khoa University in Ho Chi Minh City thought of um, in order to eliminate multi-layer flexible um, plastics. So the first example would be for um, instant ramen or pho pocket packaging that would get dissolved in hot water. Um, the materials is cassava starch. So um, technically it's all um, edible and safe cons for consumption once you boil it down um, in the hot water. And then the second example is a nursery plant bag that would, um, once it's put in, in earth, it would just decompose and become nutrients for the plants and for the soil around it. And then we have two less examples from um, a more creative perspective, furniture and architecture. So the first example here that we use from um, Northern Europe, if I'm not mistaken, is office furniture because furniture is very hard to recycle very because it's not easily dismantled or um, easily fixable. So a solution that this um, company found is that they would make their furniture modular as in it's, um, it using, it's using less screws, it's not using um, glue anymore and it could be easily taken apart to be fixed. And also they're rethinking their business model as in you don't need to own the furniture anymore but it could just be a rented piece for your office and your business. And lastly, um, there's an example of a reversible building in the Netherlands. It was used in a fair to really show that there could be low impact buildings that are using recyclable and recycled materials as the cover, the outside cover of the building. And also it shows how we can use low impact um, ways of building the structure inside as in we're not using any nail or glue so that once the um, building is not in use anymore, it can be easily dismantled and used for other purposes. So with all these examples and the very theoretical layers that we just mentioned, we hope that um, you guys have an idea, a better idea of what is circular design and what is upstream innovation. And now I'm leaving the stage back to Zhang and our panelists. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you, Tivain, for a very informative session. Um, following up with the second part of the events will be the practice part. For the sessions, I would like to introduce our three industry petitioners from different segments of creative industry. We have designers, we have manufacturers, and we have innovators. Uh, they will share with us their passions and experiences with sustainability throughout the practice. Joining, it, uh, joining with us today, we have Wu Hang An, a young and acclaimed product designer. We have Lindsay Nutley from Killer M Vietnam, um, one of the leading labels and packaging manufacturers. Uh, and we have uh, Casey Wiener, a founding partner of uh, Evergreen Labs, a creative business lab with the mission to solve environmental and social challenges in emerging Asia. So first of all, I would like our panelists to quickly introduce themselves uh, to our audience. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is uh, Huang Anh. I'm the founder and creative director of uh, a creative company. Uh, I'm based in Ho Chi Minh City and our studio is focusing on designing solutions for products ranging from furniture, interior to uh, uh, games. So um, the, the, the idea behind the, my company or my studio is like uh, 
we try to solve um, our daily problems in a creative way. So that that makes sense for the for the name of the company. So um, uh, yeah, that's uh, generally um, how um, my uh, brief introductions about my studios and my practice. Yeah, Lindsay. Uh, hi everyone. Um, my name is Lindsay Nutley, and I'm the director of marketing for the QLM Group. So in Vietnam, the QLM Group trades as Huang Ha Label Company, um, and we are a manufacturer of labels and packaging. So we have quite a quite a, a I guess a direct uh, interaction with lots of um, companies with regards to the way in which they produce packaging and how that packaging impacts on recyclability in the environment. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, Dr. Skisiya Wayne. Hi, everyone. My name is Kasha Wayne. I'm the director and co-founder of Evergreen Lab based in Danan since 2016. Um, as already mentioned, we're a creative business lab coming up with solutions and innovations to solve pressing social and environmental challenges, including uh, a lot around waste, which I'm happy to share more later. And we do a lot of work in experimentation, which includes testing, piloting new ideas and solutions, but also building innovative localized business models for true sustainability. Um, to date, we've implemented over 25 projects and built 15 solutions and are operating four uh, social enterprises on our own. We work a lot in Vietnam, of course, as we're based here, but we've also worked in seven countries across Asia. Um, our main sectors of work, um, as I mentioned, is waste, um, solid waste management, specifically in plastics, but we also do a lot in upstream innovation, as Stefan just mentioned. Uh, we do work in community tourism and agriculture value chains. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, I just have uh, questions for uh, individual panelists before we have a more of a um, sort of a discussion amongst everybody. So uh, Huang An. Uh -huh. As a fellow, as a creative, as a fellow creative, we've worked together for multiple projects. Um, I understand you believe in the role of designer in sustainability. So, how is sustainability understood and applied in your line of work as a product designer? Uh, in my line of works, sustainability is something that people are kind of start learning about. It's something rather new, and people are trying to implement it. In, uh, in the design industry in general. And uh, my work in particular uh, has um, already been uh, thinking about how we can design sustainably using uh, um, the design, like existing design methods and also working with uh, factories that, are, uh, that have the, um, the equipment and material available like within the, 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 the requirements of the at the industry, uh, for example, uh, my um, my main products um, is uh, furniture, and uh, we are focusing on um, uh, solid wood furniture. And um, most of the solid wood products are uh, like require the raw material from uh, different sources. But uh, in my particular field, like I require the the raw material to be uh, to be imported from like sustainable uh, facilities, for example, in Europe, so in America, where they um, where they harvest the the the, the lumber like um, in a very sustainable way, so that I can use the material to communicate the values of the products that we design and also produce. Um, <clears throat> uh, the um, the technical things about the um, material is that uh, it is not a common knowledge to um, to, to end cu customers, and uh, that's also uh, pose a, a challenging to designers like myself and also manufacturers that uh, people are people don't uh, usually um, aware of the source of materials or how sustainable. Uh, is the products that they purchase. So it also leads to um, the second thing is uh, how do we as designer educate the customers so they uh, so they can look at the products 
or learn about like how a product is how sustainable a product that they unconsciously purchase on a daily basis or like um, during their life can affect like the uh, the um, the industry. Uh, does it answer the questions then? Yeah, uh, thank you. So um, the next person from the panelists I would like to sort of quickly talk to is uh, Lindsay. So uh, Lindsay, we have had many conversations between designers and manufacturers in regard to the nature of packaging. Uh, we talk about industry, industrial materials like plastics, as well as the concept of uh, demonizations of plastic. Um, can you share with us today the endeavors to be sustainable from a man manufacturer perspective? And how can industrial materials can also become more sustainable? Yeah, look, uh, look. One of the one of the things about packaging is that it is a very visible part of of our lives. So one of the things that everyone does on a daily basis is buys consumable products, and and these conversations about consumable products are really important because what they do is they get to the heart of of the types of materials um, and and the the composition of of materials and how that impacts on environments. So, as a, a manufacturer of of labels and packaging, we are interacting with brands, and those brands are making decisions that uh, affect the the way in which products can or or, or whether they are su using sustainability practices or not, and. And as you know, Zhang, part of this dilemma for me is that lots of companies, they, they project images of purporting to be sustainable or following sustainability practices. But in reality, they're making decisions in this process, which is, which is cost based. And, and one of the, the complexities of that decision making process is that they choose products based on the cheapest product available for what they need to do. And so we have this with, I guess, this dilemma of there are, there are a range of options available. And one of the things that I think is really important is that the people who are designing products, um, particularly for packaging, um, labels are kind of an interesting thing because they're not the, the thing that is going to be recycled. It is the base product. And so for me, one of my big dilemmas is that a circular economy often for us is about how packaging interacts with the process. But also I think what is really important and one of the things that I really liked in the, the, the presentation at the start is that you showed an example of bananas and, and lots of people question, well, why do we wrap fruit? You know why do we do it and there's i guess a perception sometimes that that is done because it is about cleanliness or it's about you know some something to do with with ease of of, of you know the way in which it's displayed in a store but the reality for lots of food packaging is that that plastic is about reducing food waste so the sustainability argument goes way beyond just you should not use plastic and and i know in supermarkets there's a really big a big push to not use any plastic um and one of the things that i think is probably a, a more interesting way of looking at this is to go our, our relationship with the composition of materials has to change you know if we don't look at how we make stuff and how that that product interacts with the environment um recycling and recyclability is one part of this equation but it's not the only part and i think for me one of the really exciting parts is that designers have a really big opportunity to ask questions um, and to to come up with concepts but what as a manufacturer what i would also ask the creative community to do is engage with manufacturers um, as part of that process because what's needed, particularly with the, the brands that are creating these, these things is that the manufacturer is not included, you know, we're not included in a discussion until the very end. And one of the things that I love about RMIT is that you have flipped that, you make your students 
you know, work with the, with the manufacturers and understand the manufacturing process because it has a really big impact on, on decisions that are made. And, you know, and then we look at the things like, you know, the, you know, the three R's you're looking at, you know, responsible sourcing of materials like uh, Hong Anbu does. And then you're looking at, you know, reduce, you know, simply reducing the amount of materials and then recycling and recycling is, is now a really complex thing. And, and Vietnam is no different to any other, uh, other country in the world where you have to understand how those things interact. So it's, it's a really interesting conversation. And for us as a supplier and a manufacturer, when we convert materials, for us, it's kind of a little bit difficult because we're trying to interact with an industry where the base products are, are having a huge impact on the environment. And our part in that process is to make those things look prettier. So it, it, is, a, it is a constant dilemma that we have um, as a manufacturer of packaging. Thank you, Lindsay. We have some uh, practical insights from perspective of designers and manufacturers. I believe as designers and manufacturers, we all um, look forward to new innovations in sustainability, in term, especially in terms of materials, um, to adapt into our practice. So um, my questions for Dr. Wiener is, uh, how can the current general consumer products would reach uh, circularity? Thanks for the question. That's a pretty challenging one, I have to say. I think um, in general, when we're talking about consumer products and, and design, um, it really needs to come from, uh, circularity needs to come from the design phase of any product or service. So what we're doing now is a bit of backtracking and trying to solve all these issues around the current products and con current consumer goods that we have. But in fact, this design phase is critical to consider end of life and, and circularity. And I think ultimately, as uh, Lindsay has also mentioned, thinking about how who is ultimately responsible at the end for packaging waste or uh, label waste and these things is, is a big issue because it's important to preserve products to a certain point and when it reaches the end consumer that, you know, fulfills the service or, or duty. So, looking at the current products that consumers are buying now and how can they be more circular? I think the question is, how can we transform the products on the market to become more circular? And, and hopefully some of the recycling downstream can, can uphold some of the current products and the current practices. But I think there needs to be a huge shift in innovation and how we can better design our consumer goods to, to consider end of life and, and circularity from the start. But kind of trying to do it backwards and reverse is, is pretty difficult, almost impossible. And that's where I think recycling um, needs to come in. But we work heavily in that sector, and that's very, very complex um, to deal with. So I think when we design our innovations, what we're considering is two main points. Um, first, it's their ability to solve the issue at hand. Um, of course, we want to create something that is solving the environmental or social issue that we're trying to, to solve. Um, but the key point here is we're trying to solve those issues without creating any adverse effects. And I think that's often what's the case with a lot of the consumer products we see is it's not considering potential end of life or environmental impacts, or there's a lot of other things, carbon emissions, et cetera, that could be adverse effects of your product or solution. So maybe in fact, you are solving one problem, but you're creating five others. So we try to keep this um, in mind when we are designing our, our solutions, because that's ultimately what we're trying to do and, and the main point of, of our work. Um, the other point I think besides including, you know, end of life and circularity in our design is looking at the business. So we're really trying to push our innovations towards more uh, sustainable business models and being creative how business can be done and maybe not so traditionally um, as we currently are doing it. I think one really important point for that is also considering how can we uh, better improve on the pricing because uh, this is going to be a huge topic when talking with manufacturers um, and designers that is mentioned already, you know, customers of course don't want to pay more um, for these 
potentially better or more environmentally friendly products. So it's also our duty to try to innovate and push as hard as we can to get the pricing um, down so it can also be more, um, more approachable by the, by the normal consumer. Um, thank you. That's such a, a fascinating um, sort of things to we want to know more some about it, especially from the perspective of creative people. Um, so we do have a few questions for the uh, that's addressing all um, panelists today, and uh, we'll start with the question number one. Um, the question number one I have for all panelists today would be: What are the main barriers that hinders your sustainability? Uh, focus practices. What are the ch uh, challenges? You will, if you will. Go ahead. Um, from th this one thing that uh, I, I I did mention earlier about like my design practice or the the challenging with the the current design practice is in the, is the matters of labor. Uh, the because like if you think about the design industry, you only think about the 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 the, the, the designer. But actually, like if, if you look at it broader, like there's actually uh, craftsmen, uh, manufacturer, and it's like a, it's all linked together. One, one challenge of my um, of, of my um, design business is that uh, when I when I when I work with uh, with craftsmen and um, factories. Uh, the the resources is um, rather limited, and they don't have a sustainable way of uh, training uh, people or craftsmen to maintain the the know-how of the industry. For example, um, most of my furniture are made out of solid wood, and in in order to make like a solid wood furniture, you need um, carpenters, skilled carpenters. But um, the, the, the current issues with most factories, uh, they, uh, they, they depend so much on uh, machineries. They thought that if they equip themselves with machineries, they can uh, just get everything done without the human uh, input. But actually, that is the, 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 the wrong way of thinking. Uh, because if you, if you take the carpenters, the, the, the person who knows the material, who knows the process out of the equation, you cannot have a sustainable line of production. You, you can have like very good machinery, very fast production, but you are missing um, um, the, the, the first part, which is the product development. And that requires a lot of like um, experience, understanding the materials, understanding your methods. So uh, uh, a challenge, a challenging part of my uh, my job as a designer or product designer, in particularly, is to communicate with factories and with craftsmen, and uh, and um, try to learn from their point of view, so that my design or uh, whatever I design can be communicated to the factories and also uh, developed with the with the expertise of um, skilled carpenters. So, so they can, um, they they can create a patterns for uh, the next steps, which is the mass production of the furniture. So, um, one of the challenging that uh, that, that, that I, I've been experiencing is to uh, to communicate with or, or to um, uh, yeah to communicate with uh, with factories with now like skilled workers, which is a, a, a big gap. In, in the furniture industry these days. So biggest challenge for us as a manufacturer is is composition, I think, composition of materials. And and the second challenge, biggest challenge is is convenience. And I think um, the, the the reason composition is problematic is that the majority of the materials that are used in packaging are, are really, you know, the sustainability credentials are questionable. So, and they're interacting with base products that are also questionable. And, and it's why, and I, I'm simultaneously frustrated and excited because that composition argument about how do we make stuff? What is it made of and what's going to happen to it? And, 
and you know for 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 somebody who comes from uh, australia um what i what i really want vietnam to consider is that in australia to give you an example if this was the pie of how much an, an australian uses in packaging in vietnam at the moment it's that much and, and and what i'm scared of and what what you need to be scared of is that that is going to grow to that because convenience and and the ability to to use packaged goods is going to overwhelm vietnam it's going to become a massive part of this discussion and and if you don't do something about it now the waste discussion in in vietnam is going to explode and and so it's really important that you have these challenging conversations um and and i think that's that's where it leads i guess into the second part for me is that that convenience is 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 it's really great because it gives us everything we want whenever we want it as soon as we want it and and vietnam part of the thing i love about vietnam is that i can have whatever i want whenever i want it and i can just use my phone and order it but there's no penalty for that and and we um as cassius said trying to backtrack people out of convenience to hey use stuff that is reusable you know recycle things don't just throw it onto the ground and and all of these things require significant shifts in behavior and i think there's a lot of emphasis on on and while i'm i i really think that the creativity push is really important i think part of this discussion also has to push towards responsibility and enforcement of that and i think that responsibility to brand owners and then enforcement by governments is a really important part of the conversation because uh, you know it, without that these conversations and the the companies that are doing really great things they don't get the support and they don't get the the, the volume and the mass production that's needed you know i want to see every plastic used in a supermarket that's biodegradable uh, you know i i don't need it to be circular to go off somewhere to be recycled but i definitely don't want it to end up in landfill so i i think complex conversations and pressure on the right people because i think this notion that consumer the consumer can change companies is it takes a long time and i guess i'm nervous that as that little pie of packaging and and we have a really great great example of it in our business because when we talk to companies the biggest pushback we get is price and availability they just go well we don't want to pay anymore in fact, they want to pay less to change. And I think that for me breaks my little heart because I'm like, please students push, 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 get into these companies and, and demand that they change. But they're really big challenges. And I think that as a creative community, you have to realize that, that it's not, you're not just artists. You, you have to be political and you have to be advocates and you have to push for really big change. There's a perception that we're just creating cool stuff and that we're you know innovative but I, I think that you you don't understand that that the creative community really you know in the past in everywhere of the world has changed behavior and changed policy and i think that's really really important as as part of this discussion Yeah, thanks. Maybe just to share and, and echo. First, Lindsay, your comparison with the pie is quite scary, right? And working heavily in waste management, I can say that Vietnam's waste management system is nowhere near capable of handling the current problem. So if we do start to grow that pie, we're going to be yeah, um, in a world of pain. So I think it's really important conversations that we're having today and hopefully in the future about looking at how can we reduce eliminate and rethink our supply chains, our value chains, so that there isn't any waste um, in the future. So for us, I think the biggest challenge, of course, we, we face so many challenges and we're not doing business in the traditional way. We're not thinking of solutions in the traditional way. So we get a lot of kind of pushback, um, but our work often is really focused on changing behaviors and habits across whole value chains. So we work with, for example, municipalities and governments to try and change the way that they're collecting materials, how they're using materials. So that can be challenging for us. 
all the way to the end consumer and trying to change the way that they're consuming products, right? So I think one of the products that I think you showed on the slide was our Glacia brand, our glass water bottle um, social enterprise. And this is a very simple system where we just fill bottles and then of course hygienic certified facility, um, and then we refill. So with that, consumers can just call us, we can go and pick up and recollect, but the reverse logistics is a very new um, system in, in Vietnam. So first customers were really unclear how to do that. They would throw the bottles away. They weren't really able to stop and think, okay, this could be refilled. Why are we throwing it away? Actually, the environmental footprint of glass, if it's only used once, is higher than plastic. So changing the behaviors of the consumers, but of course, across the value chain for us can be quite a challenge and also very slow process, which I think has been mentioned. But I think if we keep chipping away at it also together and work more collaboratively, we can start to see a bigger impact. And on a positive note, over almost six years working in the space in Vietnam, we have seen a huge shift towards more greener awareness and people looking for alternatives. So, you know, we're coming out with these solutions and products, not because we're super environmentalists, of course we are, but there's a market demand for these items, right? So when people are asking us, why do I have to keep using plastic bottles? There must be a solution for my uh, hotel or restaurant. And so we thought, why wouldn't, why wouldn't we come up with a solution to, to fill that gap and that need? So we do see there is a shift happening. There's also new environmental protection laws, circular economy policies, EPR schemes coming into Vietnam. So I think these are all really good signs that there is a shift happening and lots of room um, for upstream innovators to play. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, I think it's a very interesting conversation we're having here with the idea of um, what are the barriers and as well as uh, what do we intend to do to break down these barriers. I would like to, so this is something um, just from my perspective as someone who practiced in the creative industry. What I'm, uh, we can see that a couple of things that, uh, at least from my perspective, we'll be having uh, what we call barriers from outside to be to try to be sustainable is we, we're doing service business. So a lot of the time what we're dealing with is is the education. So education to not only to both um, the team that we, uh, we're having on board to, to also the clients that we're working with and ideally potentially even when we've got something great outcomes that we want to educate our customers. So how do you, um, you know, you have any um, sort of ideas and suggestions how to um, sort of in a way at least simplify those barriers we're dealing with. Yeah. Thank that's a really tough one. I think <laughs> as as you as you know, and I, I've watched you deal with many clients trying to to encourage behavioral change and, and adoption of you know circularity or or even you know recyclability or sustainability and i think you know in a cost in a cost-based relationship you and i've watched you come up with all these amazing designs as a company and then you get to the end and and the company goes we don't want to pay for that and mm -hmm. and i think it, it's an interesting conversation because i think there's this perception that all of this convenience doesn't come with a cost and I think that's the bit that's missed out of this conversation is that there is a cost to all of this waste. You know, all of this stuff ending up in waterways, all of this stuff ending up in landfill, there's a cost. There's a cost to to our, you know, the, the, the health of our environment. There's a cost to the health of our people. And, you know, and, and I think that people often don't understand how that can impact on them. And, you know, in, a, in an economy where it's a relatively lower, you know, income base, people, it's hard to put that responsibility on them. And I think that's a, it's an interesting dilemma in Vietnam because, um, you know, it, it, does the responsibility lie with that consumer? But I think the other thing, and Kasi, you saw this as well. One of the amazing things about Vietnam is that they actually, people and culturally in Vietnam, are receptive to change in ways that people in the West just aren't. And I think that you have this really amazing opportunity because, you know, I watched when when they mandated the use of helmets. And, you know, as a country, you went within 12 months from no helmets to almost everyone wearing a helmet all the time. Like that is 
unheard of to do. Like Western countries would take a decade to 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 make that mm. come into effect, you know. And and I think that if we can tie health outcomes and the health of of people to some of these decisions, then and put pressure on governments and, 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 and industry to provide the appropriate ways to deal with waste and to and the design of products. Like as as Cassie said, go upstream and go, you know what, you need to design the products, you know, put pressure on the big companies, the four big companies who produce the majority of consumer waste to say those bottles need to break down, you know, enough, enough with just the greenwashing. You need to design stuff that actually does break down and then that flows through to you can't buy labels or packaging that doesn't do that you know and i think these tough conversations with industry have to come from government and but we need to have made sure that that supply of design talent and creativity in formulation of products that the people who have been suppressed have been given opportunities and funding to to make stuff come into reality Mm. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Lindsay and echo um, what he's mentioned. I think right now the consumer is paying the environmental cost um, and that's going to be a huge issue until things shift. I mean, practically the, the, the green premium, so the differential between a fossil fuel based product and a green product is too big. And right now consumers are having to fill that gap out of their own pocket and until that is bridged in some way there won't be any fair it, it's not a fair market to compete in really right because we're considering all of the environmental outputs all of the inputs the full end of life but we're competing with a plastic bottle who doesn't care at all and also doesn't have to pay tax or an additional you know greenhouse gas tax or carbon tax whatever um and so of course it's an unequal playing ground so for innovators and what we really try to do is be as competitively priced as possible because until that shift happens and Honestly, after COP26 and thinking about carbon tax, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, we, as designers and innovators, really need to push how, how far we can get the price down. Because I think for a consumer, once the pricing is competitive, they'll be very open to trying a new product, if it's more green, right? We come into a little bit of an issue, especially in, in Vietnam with greenwashing, there's a lot of vocabulary around how there's different bioplastics and compostable, non-compostable, oxo-degradable, which is really terrible, actually. So there's all of this language that's really complex, and people are trying to get away with it um, without really considering the end of life and just being a, a green product that's still having the same you know, negative environmental impact. So I think also with the new environmental protection law, there's going to be some definitions and key vocabulary defined by the ministry, which will help clarify the market and clear up a lot of the clutter. Um, and that should happen soon, hopefully next year. But you have to be very, very knowledgeable as a consumer these days to make sure you're purchasing a product that you know has the best possible outcome and still potentially pay the price for it. Yeah. So of course, for designers and consumers, it's, it's kind of a loose-loose because we're all trying to do the right thing, but the market and all with these kind of older uh, traditional uh, manufacturers and players are not really allowing us to do that yet, but I, I'm still very hopeful that that will change. I think the, the, the price comparison will be the first thing that customers like uh, think about when they consider a sustainable product and a non-sustainable product because of popularities or uh, uh, normal behavior. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's also play an important part in, um, in our designer's role in educating the customer because that's not the only uh, point that customer need to be aware of. And I think like um, uh, part of the, the information that we as designers should provide our customer with is also how the, how the products uh, end up in the, in the space, in the living space, um, contribute to the general global kind of uh, impacts because of the industry. For example, most, uh, I'm, I'm um, lucky enough to, um, to to be able to work directly with uh, with clients, and uh, most of them are open, are very open to my uh, 
um, to my suggestions in terms of my um, kind of um, information provided in terms of how sustainable the products that I'm suggesting for their family or for their homes are, and they're very welcome. They're quite open-minded and they very welcome the amount of information that I'm giving them. Not so much about like how prices are, are different because like that is that is the, what helped them make the final decisions, but also how they can learn about the product coming out of an industry that they, they are completely unaware of. For example, like uh, uh, most people, um, um, come, um, most people thoughts about furniture as something that they can just buy, use, and if it breaks, they throw it away, and not even thinking about how it impact the environment or where does the the waste or the broken chairs or table goes. So uh, uh, part of my job is also to educate them on uh, uh, think about the life lifespans of the products and. Um, uh, at the same time, I'm, I'm making like a, a solid wood, high quality solid wood furniture, and I'm off also offering them the service of like fixing the furniture if there's any problems in a way that I'm offering them like a, a lifetime, almost like a lifetime uh, um, of, of the products, a, a longer, offering them a longer lifetime of products instead of like getting them um, so. Um, letting them throw the furniture away. I'm offering them like a way to uh, fix the furniture or like update it with like a, um, a new, newer looks so that they can keep the products for longer. And another thing that uh, I think we, uh, we all can agree upon is the, the packaging for the, for the furniture industry is also a massive waste. I have to use the word massive because it's actually a lot. Like uh, when, when you when you deliver uh, a chair or a table and you unpack the box, you uh, it comes with a lot of like a cushion, foam, plastics, and everything that support the products within the box. But after you install the the the, the products, a shelf, a table in the place, you end up with pretty much that that exact box uh, with a lot of plastic foams and carbons in there and they all like go into waste and some sometimes it's actually annoying the customer that the the products comes with that much uh packaging or that much that much waste so at the same time like we're trying to provide a safe packaging solution for the products but in return like that that amount of safe packaging becomes a, a, a problem become actually it, it, it's a big problem because like people only use what's in the box and they, they just throw the, 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 the packaging away without even thinking about how, how they how they end up in landfill or how they get recycled. Some might get recycled but some might, most of them are not. So that is also one of the uh, the, the big problem in the in the furniture industry that uh, I, I, I encounter with. And uh, one of the su suggestions for my part, for my uh, local customers, is that uh, I can propose them uh, 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 a minimum amount of packaging because it's, it's local delivery. So if they if they are aware of the the, the lo local impacts of uh, waste materials, they they can they have an option of not receiving package extra or excessive packaging and only getting the exact products that they. That, that, that they get so I, I think that I mean that that, that should help a way of um, limiting the amount of waste in landfill after products is actually delivered to customers cool um, great uh, thank you uh, thank you to all panelists that I would want to close this discussion before we move on to Q&A with sort of a um, question from myself particularly it's um, we uh, like as a design studio we're really excited every time we reading information about new in innovations or new like uh, uh, ideas in terms of practice and so on and so forth especially like when we look at you know the portfolio of evergreen labs and so on we would want to see uh, uh you know to use to be able to like get a hands on these things and use it uh, these materials in in uh, real work right uh, and i'm sure from the innovator kind of sides we kind of uh, i can imagine um uh, Evergreen Labs would want to see these um, their innovations reaching the um, mainstream status that are being used more and more by the public. 
So what do you guys think would be able to help us reaching this gap and transfer the knowledge from a, a natural practice from innovators uh, or, 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 or sustainable thinkers to a more public uh, designers and, and uh, and people who practice in the field. Thank you. I mean, from our side, we we feel really comfortable in, in the role of innovation, right? And as the innovator. So we look always for collaboration and collaborative partnerships to where we can focus on you know, building out sustainable solutions, but don't have to worry about making beautiful furniture out of our recycled boards, right? That's not our job to then go further down the value chain. So we really look for partnerships and we've established some. Um, the past uh, five years, we've really been trying to build solid cases and, and sustainable business models as well that really can hold their ground. And now we're scaling up. So for example, our, our reform plastic business now is opening its fifth factory in, in Southeast Asia, which is manufacturing boards from low value plastics. All the packaging that was described for your furniture, that would be something that we would take to actually make into boards and then it gets on, you know, goes into construction industry or gets made into furniture. Then to ensure the full um, life cycle, we actually will buy back that furniture if the customer doesn't need it or doesn't want it anymore. And then we can reshred it and make new boards. So we're trying to keep, a, of course, a circular system with this, but it's not in our interest to do the full value chain, even to the end client. We, we tend to work with manufacturers or designers to help us with that end end of life or, or sorry, end of the value chain um, step. So I think for me, that's really, really important is finding collaboration partners and ways to work together. Because I think on the other side, designers don't necessarily need to work out the cost of feedstock and raw waste and right, that's, that's where we would sit on the value chain. And I think that will help us also push our solutions, um, also create more, more opportunities for consumers to have alternatives um, in the market so they can purchase more sustainably or more consciously. So I think that comes hand in hand and we always um, are open for, for partnerships and collaborations. Yeah, look, I think for us, one of the things that, that we think is really important in this discussion is, is formulation, you know, is, is making sure that that I would love for behavioral change to be like the thing that we could focus on. But I think that the the canary in our coal mine now is is formulation of products and in particular, and not just plastics, but I think plastics is a really great place to start because I believe that te there is technology there and there's innovation there, but it needs to be mandated. And, and I think that one of the things that I would love to see is 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 some way of, of identifying that to customers and and you know and for brands that choose to not do it i think you know and, and and a really great example that someone gave me the other day is that when you buy a packet of cigarettes it has a big sticker on it that says you know what this is what's going to happen to your health and someone said as in our conversation they said well imagine if you bought you know your washing detergent and on that washing detergent container it had a big sticker that said you know what this is what's going to happen to this pack at the end of it and it has a picture of a really horrible environment and I thought maybe maybe that's the shock value that we need at the moment. And and you know, I ideally it would be great if 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 it could be mandated by government to say to industry, hey, you need to change because the other scary part and Huang Ambo, you raised this consumer waste is is actually only a relatively smaller part of the waste discussion, you know, industrial waste construction and 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 other mining waste it is really big and but what we need is we need to feed through the things that consumers get impacted by first in order to drive change because if we can get change in consumer products then that will filter through to industrial products to the the wrapping for furniture to make sure that these products have uh, an interaction with our environment that that is more sustainable because without that sustainability, you know, it, it's kind of scary. And and somebody mentioned the 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 great, you know, gathering of leaders. Twenty fifty is just outrageous. And and I think people need to say that out loud. At, at creative communities need to stand up and go. 
this is rubbish. 2050 is just crazy. And, and, and people need to be willing to stand up and say that. And I think, you know, as a person who participates in this industry, the thing I want, I want the, our interactions with clients to be is to, to take responsibility, not just go, well, this is a price driven conversation. For my part, I, I would like to see how designers can um, um, take the take the role of uh, take more of the role of educating the customers uh, and raising their awareness of uh, how sustainable the design or the packaging of the design should be moving forward. Because uh, without the customers or the clients' approval of like how the product should be packed or how the product should be manufactured like um the, the the demand is still going to be there because they they if they constantly asking for like i need my food to be wrapped i need my need my furniture to be overly packed for like uh, easy uh, transport or something like that i mean the the industry will not like uh, will not even consider sustainability uh, solutions so um that that is one one thing the the second thing is uh, it is a very small um, example but uh, uh you, you know how when when you book your um your food on grab like they give you a little like button say like do you need plastic cutlery or something like that i think that is a very um i mean funny way but very uh, impactful way to let the, the, the end consumer decide for themselves whether they need that little extra cutlery because most most people order food like um to a to a place where they already stationed, like their home, the office, where they already have those kind of uh, uh, utensils or uh, facilities. So uh, that is a, a very good example of how like design can offer the end consumers like a, a thoughtful decision before buying simple products. I mean, it can be applied to furniture, to construction material, to many different industries. So that's uh, Um, all right. Um, thank you, very, um, the panelists, to um, uh, help answer these uh, great questions. I think due to the limited time we have, we unfortunately have to conclude the panel discussion. We move to the Q and A with questions from the audience. Um, we the way we're going to do it is I will basically match one questions with uh, I with the panelists that I think will be the best person to answer the questions. Uh, but feel free if you want to uh, adding any information. Uh, feel free to add in, um, but please be mindful of the, the time that we have left. So uh, we'll start with the questions that were sent in uh, during the uh, in the event registrations. Um, for the questions that we haven't got around to, our team will respond to you via emails after the event. So within that questions, let me pop up the list real quick. And for the questions that were sent in, Pham Hoang Ngoc Mai, fashion designer, as that is sustainable design a hindrance to creativity? Um, I would like Kwai Nan to answer this question, please. Is sustainable design a hindrance to creativity? I don't think so. I think sustainable sustainability is a new way to look at creativity, creativity because uh, creative itself is something that you um, you think of when uh, when when a solution is uh, is needed so uh, if uh, if you can think of a way to solve the same problem in a sustainable way i mean that's the best creative creative one can achieve uh, in contrast to like consider sustainable an, an element of limitations or of uh, difficulties because in a way like the, my point of view toward design is uh, seeking for solutions like we constantly seek um, solution to daily problems mm. uh, thank you Huang An. i have another questions from Huang Minh Han, a graphic designer what do you think are the factors that are going to make the designs and products sustainable? Uh, I would hope uh, Dr. Kasia Wena would uh, answer this question, please. 
what do you think are the factors that gonna make the designs or products sustainable? Um, I think to answer that, it's a very general question. Um, when we look at designing a solution, it's really down to the first, the problem that we're trying to solve. I mean, we're not just creating something to make a lot of money or to maybe, I don't know, communicate or greenwash. So we try kind of from the bottom up, look, what are the solutions at hand? That's also how Reform Plastic was started. We did a lot of beach cleanups and we saw a lot of plastics, but we, what we noticed was that there were certain types of plastics that weren't being recycled. So we found that there was no solution and decided to craft a solution around that. So I think we, you know, in, in kind of how we build out, we really look at from, from a problem side first and then from a market side. So we didn't want to make, um, you know, we looked at doing things like poles or planks, but we found that the cost of these products were quite low in Vietnam and the comparative cost that we would create would be quite high. So we wouldn't see a market for that product. So we kind of reversed and went back to, to simple boards because we could be really price competitive. Um, and so all of those things are kind of considerations in the design and sustainability part of our work is looking at, is, are we actually solving the issue? Um, of course, we're not creating any adverse effects. We're making sure that we're being fully, not only environmental compliant, but there's no adverse, I don't know, waste materials or social issues that are being caused um, from what we do. And then trying to be more sustainable in terms of financially, um, because that, of course, allows you to make long-term impact, which is really important, um, and considering more market-based um, solution. So it's great to have designers think of really, you know, wonderful, beautiful products, but I'm seeing a lot of great comments in the Q&A about mainstream, right? That's really where the impact is created. That's really where we can make a difference. And so we have to consider those, you know, three, I think I mentioned three factors uh, when we design our, our products and solutions. Thank you, Dr. Wiener. Um, I think the, the next question is from registration form that I, I think very interesting and very challenging as well. So I would like to address it to um, both Huang An and uh, Dr. Wiener, is uh, how do artists and creative workers consider indigenous knowledge of diverse type as sources of inspirations for sustainable practice in their visions of creativity? What are the opportunities and what are the limitations of curating sustainability from indigeneity? Basically, it's about how to, you know, about traditional knowledge and involving that into sustainable practice. You will. The question, sorry, the question is from Ichiha, anthropology researcher. I think um, the, the current issues with uh, Vietnamese uh, craftsmen and artisans is the, the, the liking or losing of information transform, uh, transfer between generations. For example, in, in, in my line of work, I work with various carpenters. Some come from like generations, a family with generations of carpenters. Some are starting out as an uh, apprentice. And I see the gap between the, the, the uh, within the, the, the industries of, uh, of, of carpenters that they, they didn't know how to handle the problem. They thought like they, they have a different uh, uh, point toward the, 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 the industries. And that gap is an issue for my design and uh, um, manufacturing practice is like, you cannot communicate the, 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 um, with them the, 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 the vision because they, with with their personal experience or their background knowledge, they both um, they they look at the problem in a very different way, and they are not able to deliver the final products. So I think the the the, the solution should be like how do we make the information or the indigenous uh, knowledge available between the uh, the the old and the new generation so they can pass it on because it's not only about passing on it's also about training and then um uh, pay um spending the time training because if you look at the craft it it is something that you need time to master it's not something that you can get overnight like a like um like a device or something 
it, it, it takes time. So I, I think that is one of the issues with the current sustainable workforce or, or the, the issue with the sustainability of the local workforce and knowledge within Vietnam. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting question. I haven't really thought about it like that. But when we are, are crafting our, our solutions and innovations, one really important thing um, that I maybe forgot to mention was that we are looking to adapt and contextualize our solutions to the local uh, context. So we're not trying to change, you know, completely the value chains or shift um, how Vietnam is doing any of their the supply chains or consumption. We really try to figure out what is the need, what is the solution that makes sense, and how can that best fit into the local context. And so using the local knowledge of how things are being manufactured, um, of course, there's some things that maybe need to be adopted or changed slightly, but we really try to design our product so that it slides in really nicely into that local context. Um, because first of all, I think that's really the more sustainable way. Otherwise, you're going to have to change the mindsets of like when I'm said craftsmen and right how things are made and all of this, which doesn't also make a lot of sense, but it's not the most sustainable way for your solution to get uh, adapted quickly. So we always look to, you know, maybe find a solution from Australia, bring it to Vietnam, but how it's working in Australia will definitely not be the same way it's working and fitting into the Vietnam, Vietnamese context. So part of our work and innovation is also how can we bring in indigenous knowledge, current supply chains, ecosystems, and adapt so that it will best fit uh, the local ecosystem here. Thank you. Um, that was such a great answer and great questions. Um, so we're moving on to the questions in uh, that we collected from the chat box. Uh, we start with a question from Lin Zhang, um, and I think this is addressing Lindsay. Uh, which solutions are currently applying to minimize the carbon footprints of packaging? Oh, look, there there are some really great things being done in in this space. So you know, from responsible sourcing of materials and sustainable forestry to um you know there's a there's a, a a product that's just about to become standardized across labeling where it will mean that labels uh, effectively all label materials will have a wash off adhesive um but when i say this i am talking about these are for responsible suppliers not for for irresponsible suppliers and and you know and so there are some really great innovations that are coming um, but I think the formulation questions continue to be asked. And I think that, you know, one of the things that I refuse to do as a manufacturer and converter is to go, you know what, there's, there, it, this is really rosy. I think, you know, I, I, I think it's really important to have really tough conversations. And, and part of that thing is that, you know, what, what I always used to get from students is students would always say, I just want to use a recycled material and they didn't care about any other part of the sustainability equation you know so so if if re using a recycled material used more resources and wasn't then recycled they didn't care it was it was that was the the vision they had was that it just had to be a recycled material that i used to make my packaging whereas now i think we're starting to see a sophistication roll through with the way in which people look at packaging um it there is a lot to be done though and i feel you know I, and and one of the things that we are working with as a as a company is to find supply chain to 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 find industry innovators and people who are going to make it you know affect some change you know a, a really great example is the packaging that is used with what we send out you know how do we find a bag supplier where the bags are biodegradable how do we find you know but have been produced in a sustainable way? How do we minimize, you know, and encourage behaviors in our customers that, that it can affect change? Um, but it's, a, it's an ongoing discussion. Yeah, thank you, Lindsay. Uh, the next question from our chat box is from An Nguyen. Uh, I want to ask the panelists that, uh, reflecting on your own practices, how much more costly are sustainable solutions transparent ethical material sourcing, product manufacturing, et cetera, than easier, convenient, less sustainable approaches. If the practices and products are more expensive, how do you think sustainability can be more accessible to the mainstream public? 
rather than appealing to a certain group of people with medium or high income. Um, so I think Dr. Wiener would be the best person to answer this. Sorry, let me repeat the question. Also, Wiener, uh, Dr. Wiener, I think you're on mute. Um, Sorry, so the question, you. yeah. I want to ask the panelists that reflecting on your own practices, how much more costly are sustainable solution, mm. uh, transparent, ethical, material sourcing, product manufacturing, et cetera, than easier, convenient, less sustainable approaches. If the practices and products are more expensive, how do you think uh, sustainability can be more accessible to mainstream public rather than appealing to a certain group of people with high, uh, with medium to high income? Mm. Okay, thanks for, for repeating. So I, I think it's, it's still going to be a, a long way until we're competitive with standard plastic products or other fossil fuel based products, um, especially if there's no environmental costs being considered um, for those types of products. Um, just as a, com a comparison, so we just did a, a quick price comparison a few days ago on, on straws. Um, so a plastic straw versus uh, the cheapest alternative, which is paper. Um, so if you compare the minimum price between plastic and a paper straw, it's still 42% more expensive for paper alternative. So we are far from that, you know, bridging that gap. Um, there are some alternatives that come close, um, but you, know, you can see that it's really still a ways to go in terms of, of meeting that or lowering that green premium. Um, in terms of our work, um, we are always looking at at our competitors and, and doing an, uh, an analysis on that. Um, for, for Glacia, for example, we're the cheapest uh, glass um, bottle water um, in Vietnam and we're the only one that's taking it back and reusing it. So the only one with a circular refill um, business model. So that of course is one of our competitive advantages that is of course not as cheap as like the local, not very sure the quality water that you get in plastic bottles here. But if you're comparing it to other glass competitors, it's also still relatively compatible with other um, plastic uh, bottled waters. But that of course then becomes a decision of the consumer. Is that the product that they're looking for? Do they also want to use that in their marketing or communications that might make, help them make the switch? I think making things more mainstream, it, it's gonna come from both ends, right? So on the consumer side, being more conscious and aware and having you know, more sustainable purchasing decisions. Um, and then on the innovator side and designer side, we need to be providing those products and those alternatives at the best pricing that we can to really meet in the middle. Um, of course, there'll be some sacrifice on both sides. Maybe our product isn't as you know, designed or creative as we would have hoped, but then on the other side, um, the consumers might have to pay uh, slightly more for that product. But I think that is where we can meet in the middle and what we can do today. Um, I think also there's a lot of room for innovation to still lower costs quite dramatically um, for a lot of different products, even plastic bag alternatives and things like that are still quite um, expensive. Um, but it's, it's a timing play. It's also an educational play on the consumer side to really start um, considering that. Um, and I don't think all products are only for medium or high income, um, but if we would provide a product, uh, for example, like, like Glacia to a lower income person, I'm, not, I'm sure there's still a lot of consumer education and awareness that would have to go into that, not only about the price. And I think Huang An has also talked about this as part of our job is to really start raising awareness about sustainability and then being able to approach those markets. So even if we are offering the cheapest solution, there still might be chucking the glass bottle in the trash, right? Which is not the purpose of what we've designed. So I think it goes hand in hand with pricing and then the consumer awareness as well. Thank you, Dr. Wiener. Um, the next question is from Min Wing. Realistically, as uh, an end consumer, what are some small steps I can do to contribute to the progress when there's not enough sustainable solutions available yet? Where can I start? Um, sorry, I got to be Dr. Wiener again, I'd say. Do you reckon? Oh, I think a bit of everybody, but yeah, yeah. there's a lot of places um, to start. I mean, it's not all, all gray and, and, 
you know, dim, there's a lot of hope and we've seen so many innovations. I think Tatan presented quite a few really interesting ones, including, including a lot of solutions coming out of Vietnam uh, for edible packaging. There's also, I saw shrimp um, bioplastics and all of these things are, are innovated out of, out of Vietnam, which is really great. Um, I think for, for your daily kind of consumption, what can make a huge difference is just being a more conscious consumer. So when you have a choice, um, you can always revert to, to the more environmentally friendly one um, and be more educated. So if you do notice, great, I'm not having a plastic bag, it says, I don't know, oxo-degradable bag, but look that up and try to understand what that means. Because in fact, oxo-degradable is worse than plastic bags. So you should be a, a well-educated consumer so that you can make the right decisions. And ultimately, no plastic is the best, right? So if you can avoid packaging or using of it, have reuse, bring your own bag, uh, bring your own bottle. All of these things are ways um, to to take action today. I also think you have a lot more power within your network and your group than you realize. So having these discussions with your friends, more importantly, having these discussions with your families can really have an impact. We do a lot of work with education in schools and collection pro programs at schools. And what we've seen is that the, the students go home and they teach their parents and their grandparents about these issues. And then they start to collect and store separate their waste. So that's where you can really grow the impact. And I think you undervalue, maybe you've, you're feeling a bit hopeless or, or helpless and just the one small individual, but starting to grow that knowledge base will start to shift markets and open it up for innovators and more alternatives to come in. Yeah, I, and I, I think that vocalness, like be vocal, be vocal with 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 industry, be vocal with the products that you're buying from companies and be vocal with government, but also in your community. People assume a helpless position that I can't make a difference. And and you know what, um, you, you can um, don't just do it with your with your purchase decision, though, put pressure on the companies that you buy from to to change their their habits you know if you buy washing powder as in a plastic tub send a message to the people and say you know the companies and say i want this in a, 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 a container that demonstrates the values that you put on your website because trust me all those companies that are producing this stuff have got wonderful green messages on their websites call them on it and call the behaviors but be vocal be vocal in your community be vocal with your friends, be vocal with your purchase decisions, but government as well. Work on multi-levels because if you don't do that, the responsibility on companies like Dr. Wiener's and Huang Anbu's, it's it's not fair. And, and you need to put that pressure and constantly apply it. Thank you. Um, the next question is from uh, Pham Thi Hong Nhung. And, uh, her question is, I work in the packaging field and I have a question for Lindsay. Uh, how do you describe the market for green packaging in Vietnam? Um, look, uh, and, <laughs> and I'm, I'm trying not to be gloom and doom with this because I think it's, I think it's, it's undeveloped. I think it's, it's still a price discussion. And I think that, that we have this notion that the responsibility lies with the high, higher level consumer. And I think that needs to change. And I think the responsibility of, of where these, where these, you know, innovations and changes come from has to change as well. You know, it, it's, it, it's often directed to the converter. So people are going, it's, you know, why are you doing this? And I'm like, we just use what we have and what we have available is, is limited. It's growing and, and there is, there is a mood, for change but i as i said to you be vocal be vocal with people and companies and make them change make mcdonald's change make the supermarkets change make you know uh, building industry s suppliers change and and it was really interesting because everyone does focus on packaging but someone gave me a really great example when I, I asked people to give me an example and they said you know in vietnam people paint a, paint a building so they use low quality paint and they don't seal the building and it's terrible within two years you have to repaint the building again you've got mold issues you've got all these water dampness and and this range of things so often they have to you know start again that's not sustainable behavior either this you know 
seal buildings, use good practices, you know, and, and talk with industry and go, hey, this notion of circularity, of, of making good decisions, it, it has to permeate everything, not just straws. You know, this is this is about behaviours that look at the longevity of the way in which we use resources. And those resources are not just consumer based everyday items. This is a, is a big, a bigger discussion. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, Fong asked the questions. How do you measure your environmental impact in the various ventures of Evergreen Labs? So this is for Dr. Weena. Yeah, I guess that's for me. Um, I'll just keep it brief, and I'm happy to also talk offline, so feel free to contact me. I mean, of course, we've set up um, an internal monitoring evaluation framework uh, within our organization to measure all the different activities. So we're collecting data, uh, usually monthly, but also weekly on different things, such as how much waste have we collected or processed, um, how many educational programs and people have attended, et cetera. So we, are, are, we have a very... Um, simple but uh, a framework to to measure our our impact yeah. yeah so the next question is um from what would you want the investment uh, community to do to understand about your sustainability work um so can you uh dr kasia wena and uh Huang An answer this probably what would you want the investment community to do to understand about your sustainability work? I think uh, educating the investment community is the same, take the same amount of efforts as educating a single customer in terms of if, uh, how they should be aware of how the sustainable the product they're purchasing is. Because, um, I mean, it's pretty much about the general knowledge and how um, how they, they they want to uh, their jobs to be impactful to the environment in a responsible way. Yeah, I think from from our side, I'm not sure exactly who investment community they're referring to, but. Um, if I'm talking about like an impact investor, um, that became quite a trendy term over the past few years. Uh, that's generally great because they claim to be supporting entrepreneurs who are socially or environmentally driven. However, it's a responsibility of these investors to also understand that they cannot put the same targets or ROIs on impact businesses as they can traditional businesses. So we've seen a lot of requests of, you know, very um, traditional financing options for social enterprises and social businesses or expectations, um, very similar. And, and it just doesn't work like that, right? We are working in a completely different field. We're up against many different barriers. We have a slower turnaround or maybe a, a growing consumer base. So there needs to be some sacrifice also on the investor community and understanding that if you are claiming to make that uh, commitment towards impact, then there also has to be some, you know, give and take uh, in that relationship. You can't have the best of both worlds, right? You can't have, oh, my wonderful impact portfolio, and I also get all of the uh, the return on investment that I that I need. That doesn't work like that. Very interesting. Um, the next question from Anwing: Do you think the responsibility of being sustainable? is still often expected to be practiced by individual consumer why efficiently it should happen at a more systematic level for example policy making manufacturing models of big corp etc well it's a difficult questions <laughs> all right yeah okay i'll start i i think it's everybody's responsibility <laughs> very simple i think we all need to join hands and really go forward of course bigger systemic change is coming from the policy making side and as i mentioned earlier there are a lot of really promising policies coming into place if they will get enforced that's a different topic that we definitely won't talk about today but they are you know taking that step forward so i think the more pressure as lindsay said more vocal we become more demanding for you know, alternative products more educated we become these are all 
everyone's responsibility. And that will start to shift the landscape towards more sustainable products and more sustainable business environment, more sustainable political environment. But yeah, I think it's, it's really everyone's uh, responsibility now. I think also when I said that before about be vocal, if you are going to be vocal, there comes a responsibility with that. I think we all have, you know, rights, but we also have responsibilities. And while I say put pressure on, you know, industry, put pressure on government and put pressure on your community, you have a responsibility to participate in that process as well. And, you know, and one of the, the beautiful things that Wang and Vu said was, you know, giving customers an option to have packaging or not, it might seem small, but it's a start and it's a it's a conversation that that, you know, I think it's really, you know, it's a small thing and, you know, it, it's 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 a, the next step on from do I want cutlery with my meal? You know, it's like, do you want pa extra <laughs> packaging with your stuff? And and those things, you know, if that becomes the norm, you 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 affect a change that that can have a big impact. So I, I really applaud that. I think it's it, it sounds like a small thing, but it actually it creates a, a, a sentiment with the way we interact with consumerism. I think uh, Lindsay mentioned uh, a great example to answer this uh, seems to be complex uh, questions of uh, how Vietnam implement the helmet compulsories for every um, people like uh, riding motorbikes. Because like if you if you make people or if the lawmaker force people to do things that doesn't make sense to them in in this in this case the end consumer they they would just gonna reject it like no i don't want like sustainable products i don't want to pay more for sustainable products but if we if we spend or if the lawmaker uh, spend time and educate the, uh, the consumers about how benefit or how good the sustainable products can help the environment in general i, I think people are willing like when they have when they receive enough information to be aware of it, I think people are happy to to, to, to join force and um, and make it a, a common thing. It's like they will they will educate themselves and their friends about how they should become sustainable themselves, or they, they should use sustainable products or choose sustainable products over the normal ones that was created unconsciously about how impactful the environment uh, is. So I think it, it should happen from both top to bottom and also from the bottom up. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I think we still have time for uh, two more questions. Then we're uh, just answering everybody from the message chat box. And the second to last questions would be from Hung Wing. Do you think sustainability in design will have a negative effect on compromise user experience in any way? So I hope I would hope uh, Dr. Weena and Huang An would help answering this. Sure, I can start. So I, I think if if it does have any negative effect or compromise, then it's not designed enough. So the point is that it should just be replacing or improving user experience. If it has having any negative, that's also what I meant by adverse effects. It could be a user. Um, adverse effect, then then it's not designed enough. So if the if it becomes a little bit you know less convenient, or it's a little bit less transparent or less flexible, all of those things are meaning to me, in in my opinion, also what we do at Evergreen that it's not designed enough. It needs to keep going through piloting R and D to make sure that it's comp you know in a in a competitive or com can compete with the current um, products in the market. I completely agree with uh, Dr. Wieners about the negative effects. Like, uh, if any products, if the product has any negative effects in it, it shouldn't be a product that rich and consumer. It, sh it should still remain in the prototype or development stage. Because, like, to be frank, like, there's a lot of negative thing happening in the development stage. But that's why we call it develop development stage, so we can eliminate all the negative in effects or all the bad thing or the things that is not suitable for end consumer to receive or to experience then the, the end result that the whole design development process will be a product or an, an, uh, a product with uh, the best user experience possible 
So that, that is the only outcome um, should be permitted. Thank you. Uh, so the final questions of today, actually, I, I did skip it. Uh, but um, so the question is from Lin, and I, I would want everybody to probably contribute to this. Uh, it's The question is, what sustainable materials and technologies are available in Vietnam? And uh, what is the percentage of currently circulating sustainable packaging or products made in Vietnam? Okay, I guess that's me. Um, in terms of packaging, there is there is uh, there are limited options available. Um, if I'm being completely honest, but there are there are ways to achieve sustainability goals and to improve our sustainability position. And I think that that you know, if I just focused on resources, I would get grey. But if I look at you know, when we look at responsibly sourcing, when we look at re reduction strategies, when we look at you know, recycling and the interaction with consumer products in that the environment, then I think there are there are options available for you. Um, when you discuss it with with converters or with manufacturers, you you know, these conversations, um, a lot of people don't want to be upfront about it. And and, and saying, as you know, with me, I, I refuse to play a game where I greenwash and go yes this is great everything's wonderful everything's this you know i think you 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 need to there's still work to be done but if you are willing to look and and you know one of the other things is as a converter i we we understand price so we get that you know you are it's it's at an un, uneven playing field so we can work with people to bring that cost base down and we and we understand that that that's part of this discussion and in reference to how that relates to the previous question design is a challenge and any designer who thinks that design should be easy should be you know challenged in themselves because a great designer is always about overcoming challenge and and whether it's aesthetic whether it's functional or whether it's composition I think that if you want it easy, don't be a designer because you 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 aren't being creative at all. You're just simply reflecting what you see around you, and that's that's not being creative. For my design and manufacturing uh, industry background, the sustainable material is available in Vietnam, but uh, but it depends on. Uh, which areas are you targeting to? For example, in terms of like solid wood materials for my furniture, like all the sustainable, the the, um, the certified uh, sustainable certified um, materials are available. But uh, when when it comes to uh, packaging or so hardware, it really depends on the, the, the how cost effective the sustainable material or the the available sustainable uh, material is um, and how it plays into the the, the, the total uh, price pricing of the product because sometimes like you have to sacrifice using the, the sustainable material or reserving the sustainable material for the core product and using the traditional material for the for the uh, for the packaging of for the secondaries or the supports of the product so I, I mean to, to answer the question yes the sustainable material is available but it is a conscious decisions of uh, designers, manufacturers um, to um, to use or to balance uh, the percentage of how the, 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 the final product delivered to the end customers is. Yeah, just quick to, to kind of bring both comments together. Um, for sure, there are sustainable material options in Vietnam. I wouldn't, I think in wood, there definitely more FSC certified um, um, yeah, places to get uh, suppliers to get wood from. For our other materials, it's still relatively new, but they are available. I think the costs are, are still way too high. Um, for example, um, Uneco, which you might know of, a huge um, manufacturer of alternatives for plastic packaging, like paper boxes and, and straws and things like that. They mostly focus on uh, export markets. So they're not really selling any of their products um, domestically. And that's because the market isn't really interested in the products yet. I'm expecting once that changes, 
um, and maybe there's new laws or things coming into place that they will shift a lot of their focus back to Vietnam. So there are manufacturers actually producing material but exporting it um, as the domestic market isn't really interested uh, in the products yet. So, um, and also just, I think I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of interesting innovations um, in the early stages of development. So interesting bioplastics, interesting kind of agriculture waste into new packaging materials, all of these things are under R&D um, at universities in Vietnam, um, which I think is really promising. Of course, it's going to take um, a couple of years till that would come to the market um, as it's still in the early stages. But we have seen a lot more uptake of these new ideas, especially on the innovator level, on the designer level, um, people really trying to make a difference. So I think uh, to say a percentage, I wouldn't be able to. Um, state that confidently, but there is definitely sustainable materials available and not that difficult to find, but I'm also happy to connect. So please reach out if you are looking for something. I'm sure um, I can help connect, but um, it's still early days in terms of the, the consumer market here in Vietnam. Thank you for answering. Uh, um, and so massive, massive thanks to our panelists and especially um, everyone who joined us today. I hope you had a great time and would like to end with a few notes. Uh, we'd like to mention again that this event today will be uploaded on VFCD's YouTube channel with Vietnamese subtitles. We will also send out an email to all participants with key, uh, with takeaway documents, including slides and additional resources about circular design. In the same email, you will also find uh, our post events uh, satisfactions questionnaires to hopefully amplify the sustainable design community. Finally, we hope this event can be the starting point of our future conversations uh, about sustainability in creative industry in Vietnam. Uh, thank you to our panelists and have a good weekend, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you Thanks, so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.